Welcome everyone to Chasing Tents. My name is Abby. Thank you so much for joining me, everyone. I'm right outside the Triumph factory in Hinkley, England, right next to an absolute appreciating classic, which is the Triumph Daytona 900 Super 3. And this is my Triumph Daytona 900 Super 3. The reason I'm going to be shooting this series of episodes, starting with this first episode, is I really want to showcase uh, a lot of people what the, the kind of 70s, 80s, 90s bikes were all about. And these are appreciating classics. And at the moment, these are really getting appreciated by a lot of people. Now, I really wanted to start here at the Triumph factory. So massive thank you for, to Triumph for uh, having me here. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure. So what I really want to do, I, I want to go through some history. So please, you've got to bear with me here, but I'm going to make it really interesting. I really promise you that. So I'm going to go through everything, how Triumph really had the blueprint for success, I really had a mindset change, an absolute rebirth of a brand and how everything came about and what this factory was doing in the early 90s, which truly won the hearts and minds of people with absolutely smashing products after products, great bike after bike after bike. So please bear with me guys, let's start with the history of this brilliant brand. So in the early 90s, this was an absolute unbelievable facility, absolute state of the art, 10 acres, 14,000 square meters at that time. Now it's even expanded even more. Now Triumph had an absolute culture change with a happy, young, motivated, carefully selected team of people who had a job satisfaction and they were absolutely proud of what they did. Triumph was constantly listening to his customers and employees. They were also here for the long run. They weren't doing anything short term. Over 80% of the components were sourced from within the UK and more than 40% of the completed motorcycles were produced in-house here at this facility. Things which we take for granted now were part of the regular production of bikes. In-house high-grade CNC machining, advanced robotics for precision welds, plasma nitride hardening for those crucial engine components. They didn't lose the personal touch on the bikes as well. Hand paint striping was still part of the finish and tolerances were measured by hand with lasers. Micro alloyed steel was used to make these long lasting frames. State of the art computers did all the barcoding to keep a record of things even when a bike left the factory. Now suspension and brakes were sourced externally but they had gone through thousands of hours of research and development. The secret ingredient for continuity of production of bikes was the modular design mindset, interchangeable parts between the bikes externally and internally. This helped with economical construction. Now, even the fasteners were zinc cobalt plated. This exceeded customer rust proofing expectations. Powder coating was done in-house and everything was triple coated. 3D CAD system was used in the design process. Styling was tough and even paint was flexible because it had to prevent cracking and to match the flexible British made plastics which were not brittle at all and Triumph called them accident proof. 60 quality control checks were done. Everything was thoroughly checked. No page was left unturned by Triumph. After sales was absolutely excellent. When it came to parts and confidence, people had absolute confidence in Triumph again. Unlimited mileage guarantees were given from 12 to 24 months. Along with all these things, Triumph really brought back an absolute positive mindset to really bring a proper rebirth of this brand. And not only the brand was brought back, a lot of other models like the Trident, the Trophy, the Daytona. You know what? Triumph was back and it was here to stay. So now let's talk about the Triumph Daytona 900 Super 3. And this bike was an absolute flagship bike for Triumph. And I'm now going to go through all the reasons why this bike was so important. The Daytona 900 was an evolution of the Daytona 750. And this Daytona 900 Super 3 was an evolution of the Daytona 900. So the engine was technically 885cc and cut. It was so important for me to make that cut guys. How can I make a documentary about this bike and talk about the engine without paying a visit to Cosworth? Now long story short, before starting this film I contacted Triumph Motorcycles and Cosworth Engine Development at the same time. Now Cosworth came back to me after I did that film at the Triumph factory. Now, I really didn't tell Cosworth at that time that I've been speaking to Triumph because I really wanted to get Cosworth's 
point of view on what work they did with the engine and Triumph's point of view. So as soon as Cosworth told me what, they, what work they did, that married exactly with the information Triumph gave me. Now let's look at a little bit of history here because it's very important for us to know why Triumph came to Cosworth with their flagship bike for a little bit of their expertise. Now Cosworth, if a lot of you don't know, there were two main people involved in the birth of Cosworth. Mike Costin, so it's very important to note the surname, Costin, Cos, and Keith Duckworth, Worth. So Costin from, Cos from Costin, and Worth from Duckworth made Cosworth. So Cosworth were absolutely the pinnacle of engineering in the early, kind of late 50s, 60s, especially with their Cosworth DFV Formula One engine. Now Cosworth really put themselves on the map with their collaboration with Ford, especially with the DFV Cosworth engine, which was an absolute brilliant success in Formula One, especially in the hands of Jimmy Clark and Graham Hill with the Lotus 49, which is my absolute favorite historic Formula One car. So year on year, uh, not only that engine, other projects, especially in a rally as well, you know, Cosworth did a great job. Even now, Cosworth are everywhere. They even have, uh, a, you know, research and development center in America as well. So Cosworth were absolutely kind of at their height uh, of success when Triumph actually approached them. Now, most important thing, what you need to know is what actually happened. Now, this is an information which isn't very clear out there, uh, you know, especially when you look into Google or YouTube. Let me tell you what actually happened. So this information has been double checked with Triumph as well. The information is exactly the same. The head of the engine was made at the Cosworth foundry. The engine itself never came to Cosworth, okay? This is a very important thing to know. Now, Cosworth never sent their engineer to Triumph or head of engineering to Triumph saying, oh, you know what, Triumph needs some help. Uh, can you go and sort them out? No, Keith and Mike from Cosworth, the two main people, were directly mentoring the Triumph engineers at the Triumph factory. Okay, so the Triumph people did all the work on it. Only the head was made at the Cosworth foundry. Everything else then, you know, was done at the Triumph factory. So it was the Triumph engineers who really pushed the limits with this engine and got a lot more power. Now, even though the engine revs to nine and a half thousand revs and the horsepower is acclaimed 115, you can squeeze a lot more out of this. I mean, there was a, a race series with the triple uh, you know, and, and with these heavy duty engines, they got a lot more horsepower out of it as well. Torque is around 64, 65 pound feet and around 84 Newton meters. But what you're gonna realize, and I'm gonna tell you something very quirky about torque. Now, I love Jay Leno a lot. Jay Leno has a lot of Triumphs. He has a lot of steam engines. He has a lot of different cars. However, he said something about steam power and the torque which is delivered by the steam power. It was like the hand of God. He used to call steam the hand of God because the torque just pushes you. And the same terminology I'm gonna use for this Triumph because I've done a lot of motorway miles during the making of this film and my goodness me, the, the torque just, and the six gears are just like absolutely plush. They just, the torque just pushes you forward. So I'm gonna use that hand of God terminology which Jay Leno uses for steam engine power with this bike because I think it's, it really makes a lot of sense because the torque is very progressive, very dynamic, but it doesn't give you any kind of lumpiness. It is just absolutely smooth. Well, back to the studio, as they say, and it was very important for me to record this bit of clip from my house because of two main reasons. Number one, when I was recording the footage outside the Cosworth factory, I sat down on the bike to give you some more information on handling and suspension, and my cordless mic was in my back pocket, and I kind of lost, lost the connection, and the voice wasn't very clear. So I thought I'll, I'll do some more recording when I come home. But most importantly, when I did all my recordings at Triumph, at Alcon, and at uh, Cosworth, I then posted some screenshots of those videos to different Triumph forums. And my goodness me, I was gobsmacked by the amount of love, affection, and encouragement I got uh, for this documentary. But also, a lot of people got in touch with me to give me more information, some screenshots, some uh, kind of uh, pictures from some magazines. And, and most importantly, someone suggested this book to me, which is uh, Hinkley Triumphs by David Clark, which is uh, 
book about the early triumphs um, at the Hinckley factory, which was absolutely brilliant. But also I got a lot of mixed information from some people and with all due respect to everyone, even though I got the information from the horse's mouth like Cosworth, uh, Triumph and even Alcon, um, I'll tell you about that in a bit, um, I still thought it would be just and fair for me to kind of go home, sit down and read all those messages and, and kind of make up my mind and also read this book um, and then give you some more information. Now, as I was sitting down today, late at night, kind of recording the video, sipping on some lovely French brandy because I was just absolutely uh, overwhelmed with, me, uh, with the amount of information I've got. A lovely chap from Australia uh, called Gary, I won't give his full name, Gary, I haven't asked his permission. So uh, he's been working, uh, he was working for Triumph for 51 years, first as an apprentice at the Meriden factory and then uh, at the Triumph uh, Super 3 Daytona project at the Triumph factory and then he moved to Australia uh, with Triumph as well. So Gary got in touch and uh, I, we were just speaking uh, today about 10 minutes ago. And um, he just, re I, I, this is amazing, you know, I, I couldn't have asked for, for something better, like better re, kind of reassurance really. And uh, Gary just, just told the exact facts to me which uh, Triumph and Cosworth gave about the whole Cosworth involvement, Keith Duckworth and Mike Costin and all sorts. So I am just absolutely over the moon. So uh, let's start giving you some further information on this amazing project and the bike, which is the Triumph Daytona Super 3 900. So you really get to uh, know more uh, and I am absolutely delighted to give you this information. So I don't want to bore you with too many numbers, but it's very important to give you some numbers and some facts, also some celebrity ownerships uh, of this bike as well. So around 150 uh, Triumph Daytona Super 3s 900s were made and altogether I think they made around 850 Triumph Daytona 900s uh, and also later on they made a 1200 uh, SE limited edition, uh, 250 models uh, of the Triumph Daytona as well. Now there were some celebrities who owned this bike. So there was Earl of Litchfield who had the 1200 version and the Super 3 900 Daytona, no, none other than Indiana Jones himself <laughs> had, uh, had one bike. So anyways, uh, one important fact which I learned from this book was Nick Saunders, which had several world records. So he did and around the world uh, trip on the bike, so Triumph Daytona 900, and did about 18,000 miles in 31 days and 21 hours. And the bike, except for uh, the front wheel having a bit of a dent in Turkey, which the local Istanbul Turkish uh, dealership uh, sorted the wheel out for him, there was no mechanical issues whatsoever. Now, speaking to Gary from Australia, who's done, uh, who's worked for Triumph for 51 years, he was saying, that the bike was tested uh, in hot conditions at Jerez in Spain and uh, Bruntingthorpe, which is uh, in the UK, uh, there was some more testing done and a final sign off was given there. Also, what he mentioned that the, the heads which were done, uh, which were made at the Cosworth foundry had R written on them. So that's quite an intriguing information. Also, according to the book, like I said before, the, the Cosworth did the heads, but also the crank cases were revised, uh, which was saving a total weight of 2.5 kilos, plus another 2.5 kilos was saved by using carbon with the front and rear mud guard, chain guard and some uh, around the dash as well. If we talk about some compression ratios, so the standard 900 had 10.6 ratio 1 and the updated uh, Super 3 900 had 12 ratio 1 compression. Then the bike had upgraded tires. So they used the Dunlop D364 super grippy uh, rubber on this bike and also the swing arm on the Super 3 was black. There was a silver tie rod to the rear caliper and the bike only came with one color which was the racing yellow. High lift cams were used which were mated to the gas flowed cylinder head. The discs were machined from a single piece of billet aluminium. Price wise, this bike was around 9,699 pounds, which was 1,500 pounds roughly more than the standard Daytona 900. Then due to high demand, they made some more bikes uh, for 95 and 96 because the, the bike was in demand when it was actually produced as a flagship bike for Triumph. 
Okay, I can give you a hundred more facts about the bike and, you know, read you a lot more things from this book, but I highly suggest uh, people who are super keen to know about uh, the whole Triumph Hinkley bikes to, to get this book. Anyhow, uh, what I really wanted to get uh, out of this, this whole clip from Cosworth and Triumph, that Cosworth were involved, they were involved directly, and they did do uh, quite a bit of work with Triumph, but most of the hands-on work was actually done by Triumph in Hinkley. They just got the mentoring from Cosworth. Okay, as I mentioned before, that uh, while making some clips on handling and suspension, my voice kept disappearing. So let's continue uh, with that. So I will show you the video of uh, me outside the Cosworth factory talking about handling, but I'll be using my voice right now to explain to you and I'll keep it brief. So basically the handling of the bike at slow speeds, it's, it's a little bit tricky because you can really feel the weight of the bike, which is around 243, 245 kilos wet, totally wet. So at slow speeds, you do feel it. But once you get to, um, you know, just, you know, me medium speed, it's absolutely fine. You know, the, you put a little bit of pressures on the, uh, on the foot pegs. And because the engine is so heavy and the center of gravity is so low, the bike absolutely turns beautifully. I've done some absolutely spirited journeys from Wolverhampton to Wales about three times now on the bike and uh, my second bike is an Aprilia RSV4 RF which um, you know I you know I go to racetracks quite often and the handling of this Triumph at decent speed is absolutely brilliant so now let's move on to how this bike feels on the motorway now I've been doing quite a lot of motorway miles during the making of this uh, documentary or film. Now on the motorway, the main thing with this bike is that when you are absolutely upright, um, th there is quite a bit of wind which hits you. So some people have put some touring screens, but if you put your head a little bit down, so if you are on the motorway and doing decent speed, you will tuck your arms in and put your head down slightly. And if you do that, um, you know, the, the, the kind of wind, I mean, I don't think the bike has gone through a wind tunnel, but let me tell you, with your helmet and that screen, it's absolutely beautiful. As long as you just tuck your head a little bit down, not too much, maybe about two inches. And, you know, you know it, the juddering isn't that much. The, the, uh, the ergonomics are absolutely brilliant. The positions of the, remember, this bike isn't, was never to be a super bike. It was never there to properly compete on track with Fireblades and the GXSRs. So the ergonomics are very comfortable. There are adjustable levers, so brake lever is adjustable and the, and, the, and the clutch lever is adjustable as well. So in terms of ergonomics and comfort, it's absolutely brilliant. So there are no problems when you're doing long journeys on this bike. Okay, so let's talk about some upgrades which have been done on my bike. So I've got some bar and mirrors, which I quite like because I, I like a bit of cafe racer look. I used to have a Honda CX500, which was a custom bike, and everything was quite low on that. Even with this one, I like this low drag kind of look with the, the mirrors, uh, which are side uh, mirrors, which, which were done by the previous owner anyways. And the two exhausts uh, in the rear are SP engineering exhausts, which are about one and a half kilo each slip-on part. So the actual uh, exhaust which you get with these bike, they also come with a carbon sleeve, but they weigh around 5.2 kilos each, and I've actually weighed them. Uh, so you do save quite a bit of weight, uh, and the bike still looks pretty much the same with the carbon sleeved uh, SP engineering exhaust. Rest, I've got uh, some Maxton cartridges in the front and a stiffer spring at the back. Now, bike does come with the fully adjustable suspension anyways, uh, but I've got upgraded suspension on this bike and it feels absolutely brilliant. And Maxtons are absolute gurus when it comes to old school bike uh, suspension upgrades. Rest, not much fettling has been done with the engine. Sometimes I think about, uh, you know, getting the carbs, uh, you know, sorted out so I get more horsepower, but then who needs that power? You know, if I if I need more power, I can ride my Aprilia. But, you know, with these bikes, you really got to enjoy the theater uh, of, of riding uh, more than the actual urgency. Even in the book I was reading, uh, Nick Saunders was saying when he did the, the, uh, the all-around trip, uh, 18,000 miles in 31 days, he said it was never about the speed. Even though the bike, in, I think he was riding uh, 800 miles per day, doing 14-hour uh, riding per day. He said it was never about the speed. It was all about the kind of uh, durability and endurance and also reliability, which this bike was top trumps. 
Okay, before we move back to the Triumph factory, it's very important for us to talk about a very important upgrade on the bike, which were the brakes. And to talk about brakes, we will go to somewhere very special. Now this was the special place I was talking about earlier, Alcon specialist brakes and clutches. Please excuse the two-tone look of my jacket because I've come from Cosworth to Alcon about one hour, 15 minutes away and I got absolutely drenched in heavy rain. And I got an experience to ride this bike in the rain as well, which was absolutely brilliant. Anyways, this Alcon facility is huge here in Tamworth and they've got a research and development park right behind it. Alcon have been in the business for a very long time and Triumph chose Alcon to the, do these amazing six pot brakes which are absolutely fantastic. Alcon work with McLaren, ProDrive, they work with Aston Martin, Peugeot and a lot of defense and motorsport projects. Now Alcon know a thing or two about brakes that's for sure and these six pot brakes which were way ahead of his time for the 90s are absolutely brilliant. I have had no brake fade issues or, or juddering or anything like that. I've tested these brakes on the motorway, country roads, everything. And these are more than adequate, adequate for this bike. Now, I am lucky enough, I was lucky enough to own the previous version, the standard version of this model, which is the standard 900. And that's about 98 horsepower and it's got normal brakes. This is about 16 horsepower more. And this has got the upgraded brakes. And trust me, the bike needs it because of more power and the weight is around 245 kilos. So it definitely needs these brakes. And you know what? They are absolutely brilliant. I think there was no other bike at that time having six piston uh, brakes. And, and you know what? I have no complaints. If someone really needs modulation uh, with the brakes, if they don't like the bite, they just need to change the pads. You know, make sure there's no air in the system and get, I don't know, dual centered SBS pads or, or EBC pads or whatever. But I have no complaints with the brakes. Brakes are fantastic and they've been made by a fantastic company which has absolute brilliant motorsport pedigree. Welcome back guys, I really wanted to shed a little bit more light on these amazing Alcon brakes. Now there are two things I want to mention, one from a motorsport point of view and one from an accessory point of view. So if you had a standard Daytona 900, you could actually buy these brakes as an accessory for £850 and upgrade your brakes. On the other side, when I spoke to Alistair Ferguson, who is the MD of Alcon brakes and clutches, Alistair said that BSB riders like uh, Steve Hislop and Ray Stinger were absolutely in love with these brakes and they performed really well in British superbikes because there were no such product out there which was so reliable and it was made with a single piece of aluminium for Triumph and all they had to do was obviously remove the Triumph logo and put Alcon's logo and then they uh, obviously Steve and Ray used at the British Superbikes and they had immediate success with absolute brilliant performance from these brakes. So I really wanted to uh, uh, kind of mention this part before we move back to the Triumph factory. All in all guys, this bike, like I said, wasn't meant to do lap times. This bike was supposed to make you feel special. The bike was special. The engineering which went into this bike was special. Now I want to tell you something. I may, I'm making this series called Appreciating Classics on one side, I love it. On the other side, I sometimes think when bikes like these become classics or collector's items, people stop riding them. You know, they, they start keeping them in their houses, in their living room, I mean. You know, so I, one thing I love about this model of Triumph, especially following a lot of forums on social media, these bikes do get ridden a lot. Mine has done nearly 16,000 miles. I ride it a lot and I see a lot of people riding these bikes a lot. So the only one thing I would say to you is if you are interested in buying a Triumph Super 3 Daytona 900, make sure you absolutely enjoy it. These bikes are made to be ridden. The engines are bulletproof. The, the suspension, the sash, everything about this bike is bulletproof. You can do mile after mile after mile. So that's why sometimes I get a little bit worried uh, talking about uh, 
uh, kind of uh, appreciating classic or classic because I really want people to enjoy this the way I do as well. Okay guys, let's take you inside and show you the Triumph Experience Center. Okay guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Now I'm going to go inside and speak to some original people who were involved in the project of the Triumph Daytona Super 3. Now I'm absolutely grateful to Triumph for letting me in and letting me shoot and you know letting me go around places. I'm, I'm actually standing on a pathway with same famous names like Mike Halewood, John Cooper, Billy McConnell. Absolutely brilliant. You know, these were the, the people who put Triumph on the map and Triumph themselves put themselves on the map and guys one thing I must tell you if you ever buy an appreciated classic please make sure you ride it enjoy it I ride this bike a lot and I think everyone should now one thing I always say before I end my videos guys and this is so apt at Triumph because I take part in distinguished gentleman ride every year to help with uh, Movember Foundation the kind of suicide prevention prostate cancer male suicide loads of other things so please guys with the lockdown and covid and everything there's loads of people suffering from uh, mental turmoil just put an arm around them listen more to people and see what you can do and if you have a classic bike or a bike you know dress, you can dress dapper and come along to the next distinguished gentleman ride because triumph are always backing that and i think it's an absolute fabulous cause guys if you did like this video please throw a like for me on youtube so other like-minded people can view this video as well and also if you want to see more videos like this I am going to make a few more videos on the Triumph and also other appreciating classic please do subscribe to the channel thank you so much for watching take care look after yourself